in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is Nick Weiner of Open Channels, and co-hosting with me is Sarah Carr from the EBN Tools Network. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, presenting for us is Dr. Morgan Gopnik, author of From Forest to the Sea, Public Lands Management and Marine Spatial Planning. Uh, Morgan will be presenting for us today on how we may learn to achieve our goals in marine spatial planning from the efforts of our terrestrial counterparts. And a few notes before I hand the mic over to Morgan to introduce herself. Uh, you'll notice that there is a small reddish arrow in the top right-hand corner of their screen. If you click that, that will show or hide your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, if you have any questions at any time during the webinar, you can enter those into the questions panel there on the GoToWebinar side. Uh, we'll, Sarah and I will collect those and relay those to Morgan at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have any technical questions, we'll, of course, answer those for you right away. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and I'll post it up on opachannels.org slash webinars, webinars in a few hours. Uh, so Morgan will be presenting for us for about 30 to 40 minutes, and at the end of that time, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So again, just pop any questions you have there on the GoToWebinar control panel. And as I'm sure you all know, Morgan has been kind enough to give away a free copy of her book, of her book to a lucky webinar attendee today. Uh, so as soon as Morgan's done presenting and before we get into our Q&A portion, uh, we'll pick a random number on our attendee list, and that person will be our lucky winner. Uh, we'll be sure to message you through GoToWebinar or get your email list or email from the registration list and contact you for your shipping information. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Morgan. Uh, thank you again for presenting for us today. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks to both Nick at Open Channels and Sarah at the EBM Tools Network. Um, I have talked to a few different audiences around the country about this book and my research, but uh, I'm really excited. I'm looking at the list of attendees that I can see, and there are a lot of people, new people, people I haven't spoken to, as well as a few old friends on the list. So hi, everybody. What I'm going to talk about today, um, and Nick, I'm going to expect you to interrupt if my voice is too low or too high or if you need me to adjust anything. But, Sounds um, good. I'm going to talk about this four-year research project that I undertook and the book that resulted from it. You see a copy of it here. And to start, I'm going to talk about why I even was interested in this topic and how I got into it. So the start of the story um, comes from the U.S. Ocean Commission and its report, An Ocean Blueprint for the 21st Century. I'm sure that many, if not most of you, have seen this book. Not sure how many have read it cover to cover. But we spent some very hard working years working, uh, creating it. I was the senior advisor to the commission and had a big role in producing this report. And of the 212 recommendations contained in there, one of them stuck with me. and it stuck with me because it was um, sort of a new idea and the commission didn't even have enough background to really flesh it out. But one of the things they said was, Congress, working with the National Ocean Council, should establish a balanced ecosystem-based offshore management regime that sets forth guiding principles for the coordination of offshore activities. Now, there's a lot packed into there, ecosystem-based, offshore management re regime, coordination of activities. But that's really all they said. And there was no implementing detail of any kind to say how that would be done. Around that same time, there was a lot of talk starting to grow in various circles about something that people were calling area-based ocean management or ocean zoning or marine spatial planning. In 2006, two years after the commission report, there was a workshop, an international workshop, hosted by UNESCO on this idea of marine spatial planning. It wasn't a huge session, but there were a few dozen people there from all around the world talking about marine spatial planning, what it is, how it might work. And this is the report from that workshop. And it said that marine spatial planning would be ecosystem-based, efficient, coordinated, integrated, consistent, comprehensive, what could be better. All delightful things that we were very excited about seeing happen. And at that time, it was just starting to be practiced in a few countries, 
here is one of the first, Belgium. That's a picture of Belgium's EEZ. And the map of their plan of how they might fit all the activities they wanted into their space. And I haven't even included the legend here because it's too complicated, but there are zones for wind power and marine protected areas and shipping lanes and areas for dredging sand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this was done through a, primarily through a university-led process. But of course, that EEZ is very small compared to the U.S. and uh, probably more densely occupied than any area in the U.S. EEZ. So at the time, what people said, and I said it many times to many audiences, is to try to you know explain why marine spatial planning was not scary or a new thing is that it's really just like land use planning. Land use planning is something most people are familiar with. Most cities and towns do it. And people see it as a good way to keep incompatible uses separated. So we don't want really heavy industry in the middle of a residential neighborhood. We probably don't want a porn shop next to an elementary school. So all kinds of community values are expressed through these spatial plans. And then there's a permitting system that gets put in place. So we were saying we can do the same kind of thing in the ocean. It looks sort of similar. We'll map the ecosystem. We'll inventory everything that's going on in the space. And then we can see where there are conflicts. But the more I actually thought about this analogy, and the more I dug into the realities of land use planning, the more questions it raised in my mind. Because city planners are what they are preoccupied with is this very dense mosaic of private, primarily privately owned structures and spaces with a shared infrastructure usually. And the government's role is to sort of guide what is primarily a market-based process. Hey, Morgan. Yes. I hate to interrupt. Um, your voice is coming in and out. I don't know if your distance from your microphone is varying at all. The microphone is directly in front of my mouth, so I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe my uh, voice just goes up and down, but I'll try, to, try okay. to project right into the microphone. OK, great. Thanks. So um, where was I? So I started reading the literature of the city planning profession. And they have many, many journals, and they write a lot about it. And I realized that we were just off base. The kinds of questions they were concerned with, the kinds of things they were talking about, really didn't resonate with the ocean issues that I was familiar with. I had spent 20 years working on, on ocean policy issues, and it just wasn't ringing a bell. Because when you think about it, the EEZ um, is a public space. We give people permits to do things in the EEZ, but we don't sell off the space. They don't own it. It's, we're not managing private structures, primarily. Uh, it's a public trust space. And lawyers will argue about precisely what that means in, a legal, in terms of a legal doctrine. But we have the sense that it's a space being managed by the government for the benefit of all citizens, both current and future. And when you put it that way, what you say is, hmm, that is actually pretty similar to the government's role in managing public lands. And when I started digging into the public lands management literature and history, I just knew right away that there, I was onto something. There was a uh, total jolt of recognition. Um, for over 100 years, these agencies have been trying to manage these publicly owned landscapes in a way that accommodates many different kinds of users and balances use and conservation. So the question that arose is whether the ocean community that is trying to manage living resources, energy, recreation, and also preserving an intact ecosystem can learn something from public land managers who are also trying to manage the use of living resources, various kinds of energy, recreation, and other activities with the conservation of the ecosystem. I decided to focus on the national forest system 
for a lot of reasons, but uh, it, it offered the best analogy of all the different public lands agencies, the National Parks and the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, the Forest Service offered the best analogy, I thought, with the ocean community. And interestingly, uh, it was created in 1905, the Forest Service, and placed within the Department of Agriculture. And that was very deliberate at the time because they saw it as primarily managing a resource, a product, sort of like crops or any other kind of product, which kind of rings a bell, reminds you of um, NOAA being placed within the Commerce Department. So then I'm further pursuing this idea that maybe these two settings are similar, and I looked at the timeline involved of management of forests and oceans. And again, you see some interesting analogies, and what's most important, a time lag that would lead you to believe that maybe they've learned some things that we haven't got to yet, or that they have a head start on some of the lessons. So here's where the forest land and the ocean space were first declared to be public, owned by the government, Forest Reserve Act, and then the assertion of rights over the government control over resources in the EEC. And here's where agencies, the primary agencies were created. As we know, there are a lot of other ocean agencies as well. And here's where the government first said we need to protect some areas as uh, for ecosystem protection, Wilderness Act and the Marine Sanctuaries Act. They're a bit closer in time because it was in that key 1960s, 1970s period of environmental awareness. And here is where we told these agencies that you need to plan, you need to manage for multiple uses, and planning is going to be part of that. So the Multiple Use Sustainable Yield Act for the forests in the 1960s, Forest Planning Act in the 1970s, calling for every forest to have a multiple use plan integrated plan. And of course, just recently in 2009, we had the executive order calling for marine spatial planning. So there's some interesting similarities. So here are my, uh, this is a kind of wow moments that made me think I was uh, on the right track. From the Forest Service Manual in 1963 says, the demand for use of resources is becoming intense and there is little doubt that demands will continue to grow. Forest resources are not adequate to fully satisfy individual desires for space. And I think anyone involved in the ocean world can imagine hearing exactly those things said about the current situation in the ocean. Similarly, 1970, Linton Caldwell in an article said, ecosystem management would impose constraints upon single purpose approaches to the land and would arouse hostility among individuals whose single purpose pursuits would thereby be constrained. That was in response to calls at the time in the 70s for ecosystem-based management of the forests and his recognition that that might upset some uh, pre-existing users. And again, we see that very much uh, in debates about ocean management. So here are my research questions that guided my research. Number one, there's sort of one depends upon the next. Is the EEZ actually like a national forest in some meaningful policy relevant sense, right? Of course, anyone can say, well, they're different. One is wet and one is not wet. And species probably have more mobility in one than the other. So people over time have said and said to me when I started this project, well, no, they're different. But when I say, are they similar in a meaningful policy relevant sense, we'll get to what I mean by that. And then question two was, if there are similarities, has this long period of forest management actually produced any lessons that we can learn as we move forward with multiple use planning? Or is it just all chaos and there's nothing to be learned? And finally, question three, if they're similar and if there are lessons, how we can we use them and apply them to marine spatial planning and generally ocean management? And now I'm just a slight side track, sidebar here for people in the audience who are biologists um, or generally more on the natural science than social science side. And, that, and this is a preview to the next slide that's going to make your head spin. So the question is, 
how do you know whether two policy situations are similar or not? And here's my analogy. How does a biologist know whether two species are similar or not? So if we knew nothing really about biology, it would be easy to say that those top two species, the whale shark and the whale, seem to be more similar than the elephant and the African hyrax shown at the bottom. But in fact, we do know something about biology and how species work. And as a result, we know that, in fact, the bottom two are more similar, have more in common than those top two species. Because we know some, we can classify things based on DNA, obviously, but also based on reproductive uh, systems, based on their metabolism, based on how they deal with the world in a number of ways. And by having a structure for defining what constitutes a species, we can do more than just say, well, do they look alike or do they not look alike? And the same thing is true in the policy world. And here's how we, here's the sort of kinds of structures we use in the policy world. And I'm not going to go into any detail on these. People in the social science world will recognize them right away, and everybody else will have no idea what they mean. And in fact, I had no idea what they meant when I first started this research. Coming from um, sort of practical management perspective, I had never studied these policy theories. But in brief, the one on the top is from Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize for this work. The one on the bottom is from Sabatier, Paul Sabatier, and, and his co-worker, Chris Weeble. And what they do is set out to analyze what are the major elements in any policy situation. What matters? What seems to affect it? And, and the red circles talk about some of those key elements, and I'm not going to go into any detail about them, except to say that there are careful, um, proven, research-based ways of defining what constitutes a policy situation what, and what's likely to happen. So here's what you find using those two frameworks about some key similarities between national forests and the EEZ. So both of these spaces transitioned over time from a, what might be called a laissez-faire, open access status to government ownership and management. And that matters that the, the way something is managed and its change in management affects how you analyze it from a policy point of view. In both places, um, there are very diverse and relatively intact ecosystems compared to, say, grazing lands, which are very degraded. But in the forests and the oceans, you still have pretty intact, diverse ecosystems, but they are stressed. They're under you know, they are affected by human impacts, and in both cases they transcend the existing political boundaries. Both places offer a similar bundle of what we call goods and services. And I suspect that most people on the line uh, know what I mean by goods and services. There are products, things like living resources like fish, like timber. There are services like climate services, recreation, um, cultural services, and although they're different in their specifics, it's a similar nature of goods and services in both places, energy. In both places, you have public trust responsibilities. The government is managing the place for the good of all citizens, current and future. In both places, you have overlapping laws and agencies that are responsible. Um, this could be a whole webinar in itself, talking about what the laws and agencies are in the two places. Some people have argued that the situation is simpler in, on the public lands because, for example, in the forests, the Forest Service clearly is the primary agency in charge. It's not true in the ocean. No, it's not the primary ocean agency. It, uh, many other agencies have responsibilities. But that is less, it is less different than you think when you dig into it. Lots of agencies have responsibilities in forest lands, building roads, uh, energy, mineral extraction. Any kind of fishing involves state agencies and NIMPs. So you do get a lot of uh, push for cooperation, and there are a lot of conflicts between different agencies with different priorities 
and a lot of different laws that often conflict. You know, laws towards wilderness versus laws about getting the lumber out. In both place, places there are multiple use mandates, and that's related to the overlapping laws. There are contradictory mandates about what is supposed to be achieved on this, in these spaces. In both places, there is a divergence between local and national interests. <clears throat> there are communities that live in close proximity to forests and to ocean spaces that have a long history in those spaces and have a particular relation to them. And there are national interests, whether industry associations or big environmental groups uh, and many others, that have a different way of looking at those spaces, a different relationship to the spaces. And in both places, it's very significant that we've had an evolution of our understanding of the ecology and social interactions going on. So what was once viewed in 1910, you read the literature about forest management, and they talk about forests exactly as you would treat a crop. And at the time, this was considered best available science, and they thought that by cutting down all the trees in a particular plot and replanting the same species, growing at the same rate, and then repeating that, you would have the maximum yields, you would have healthier forests, you wouldn't have what they would saw as, oh, all dead wood and all kinds of diseases and everything else. You could make a strong, healthy, uniform forest. Of course, we now understand that that is not true. Um, and similar in the ocean, I think our, our views about fisheries have changed significantly over the decades. So when you t ask the agencies to use best available science, that's changing over time. And our understanding of the communities and how they interact are changing over time, and that affects management. So how did I go about doing this research? Very quickly, a combination of document reviews. I spent several days sitting in musty rooms looking through literally cardboard boxes of old uh, papers, reports, and permits from the forests in the 1920s uh, up to you know current day reading the current academic literature. I did a whole series of interviews, 82 interviews with forest and ocean users, academics, managers, and for anyone who does social science, you'd know that 82 is a lot of interviews. They were hour-long interviews, generally. And they were all transcribed, and it led to you know hundreds of pages of transcripts that I then analyzed using various kinds of software. And I did three on-the-ground case studies, two forests on the West Coast, one forest on the East Coast, where I actually tromped through the forest with people and talked to um, Forest Service staff and community members. So what did I find? Going into this, I was hoping, and very naively perhaps, to come up with an answer, to be able to come back to my ocean colleagues and say, wow, this is what they've learned in the forest. They've been trying to do something similar, and they've been working on it for a long time, and here's the answer. Here's how you do it best. But maybe not surprisingly to most of you, there is no such easy answer. The real lesson learned is that you are inevitably going to be balancing competing goals. And there are pluses and minuses at each end of these scales, things you gain and things you lose. And all a manager or a community interested in a particular issue can do is be very conscious of those balance points and find some way to get a little bit of the best of both worlds. But there will inevitably be trade-offs. I guess some people won't like me saying this, but there is no ultimate win-win-win solution where everybody is happy. There are going to be choices made. And the best we can do is to be conscious of the results of those choices. So here I'm going to talk about a few different balances that need to be struck. One important balance is about the scale of um, how you define and solve various problems. And that can range from national, of course there's also global, but I'm just looking at US, the US context. 
can range from national to the very local. And what are the advantages at each end of that spectrum? When you look at a very broad national level, you might be better able to implement your public trust duties. Because, as I said, we're managing these spaces for all citizens, current and future. And so even if we're talking about a forest in North Carolina, which is one of the ones I studied, we all have a stake in making sure that that forest is healthy and that we can take a vacation there and hike, or we can invest in, or we can get the timber that we need out of it, or whatever other goals there are. At the national level, you also get broader representation. We live in a democracy where we assume that the national government in some way reflects the wishes of the whole country. And you get a larger scale that may be more in tune with the ecosystem. So when you look at large marine ecosystems that are roughly correspond to the regional planning bodies for the oceans, you get a better um, match between the scale you're looking at and the ecosystem. On the other hand, when you do something at a very local scale, you have the benefit of probably more intimate local knowledge of the setting. The folks who live in and around that forest in North Carolina knew every tree, every plant. I went on a tour with one, just a community guy, he wasn't an official of any kind, and he pointed out all the Venus flytraps and where they grew and why they grew there and um, some fascinating history of how the forest had been used. You're also likely to get better community engagement. People who live right near an area, ocean or forest, generally are more interested in knowing what you're planning to do with it. And there's a chance that you'll get better monitoring and enforcement of any regulations from people who live there and see it every day than if you try to do something at a national level. And obviously, again, the answer is that you want to combine the strengths of both national policies and local policies uh, to get the best of both worlds. Now here's another thing that you're balancing all the time, which is the degree of uniformity of your laws, regulations, and pr practices. So the advantage of having very standardized rules is that everybody knows what to expect. There's certainty, there's consistency. Uh, industry often says that they like this because wherever they go, they know what the rules of the road are. It also, if you standardize things, allows you to set a floor uh, either for economics or for environment. So for example, one area couldn't say, to hell with the environment, we just want to drill, drill, drill. Uh, because you've set a floor that certain environmental values have to be maintained. And at the other extreme, you couldn't have one area say, we want to just close off our entire part of the ocean or forest um, to all use, all people, no one's allowed to go there, no recreation, no nothing. It's going to be pristine, untouched wilderness because the laws say, no, you, these are public spaces and we want them to be used in certain ways. On the other hand, allowing for more flexibility has the advantage of being context specific. What's good in one area is not necessarily going to be good somewhere else. It allows you to be adaptive. You can quickly see whether something is working or not and change your process, which would be very hard to do if you have rigid, standardized national standards for everything. And you can be innovative. You could have 50 different areas trying 50 different approaches. And if one clearly works better or works better in a certain context, then other people can jump onto it and say, let me, let me imitate that. So you have a kind of natural experimentation that you can't have when you have fixed national rules. And again, the answer is that you have to recognize the strengths of both of these ends and find ways to combine them. And finally, this one's a little more complicated, but I think there, when you read the history of Forest Service, there's a fascinating interplay between different styles of decision making. And all four of these have been tried at various times in various places. And like the others, there are benefits and drawbacks to each of them. So let me just walk through these 
um, the benefits that I see associated with these four broad different types of decision making. So first, let's look at political decision making. And by that, I mean decision making made by elected representatives. So yes, it's representative. Our democracy says that the best way to find out what people want is to let them all vote for people who will represent their interests. It has a kind of legitimacy. Once a law is passed, it's accepted. Generally, it doesn't seem to be as true lately, but let's pretend that once a law is passed, we all accept that that is now the status quo. And it has kind of stability. It's hard to pass laws and hard to change laws. So once they are in place, you get a kind of stability to that decision. Now let's look over here at the technocratic decision making. And that refers to decision making. This is primarily within agencies, but it's done by experts by people who are supposed to be objective and science-based, making rules and regulations that carry out the political will of laws in a, in a way that um, is guided by more in-depth understanding. An advantage of that over laws is that it is somewhat adaptable. It's hard to change regulations, but you can change them if you see they're not working more easily than you can change a law. Um, where am I next? Let's talk about judicial decision making. And of course, there's much more to be said about each of these. I want to try to finish up here so that you can ask questions, but I'm happy to come back to this slide and talk a bit more about some of the drawbacks to each of these as well. But judicial decision making also has some advantages, and there we're talking about decisions made by courts. They're viewed as being independent of the political process, and even sometimes more independent than the bureaucracy, the technocrats, who sometimes maybe get too close to the people they're regulating. So you have some independence. They're respected as being objective, often, usually, although that also can stray. And they bear the weight of law. So once uh, an issue has been adjudicated through the courts and appeals and appeals and appeals, um, you have people can hang their hats on that as being the interpretation of the law. And that sometimes is helpful in definitively resolving conflicts. Finally, this collaborative mode of decision making, which is relatively newer. It's only been done in the forests for the last, say, 20, 25 years actively. And I, I would argue that it has not been done yet in the ocean context or certainly not been done very broadly. Um, and the idea there is you bring all the interested parties together, build trust among them, have them all put on the table what their interests are, what their values are, what they're seeking. And then you find that there's often common ground. And you look for compromise, and you reach collaborative solutions. It's a much less adversarial process. Because of that, it can often be quicker. It's not a quick process because it takes time to build trust, but it can be a lot quicker than going through decades of court fights, which is what happened in a lot of forests where everything was completely gridlocked and tied up in lawsuits. For a while, every single Forest Service decision was taken to court. Whereas more recently, there have been several uh, national forests where they use a collaborative approach, and as a result, their decisions are not being taken to court because everybody knows what to expect in advance. Again, a lot more to be said about that. Um, it was probably the most eye-opening and interesting part of the research to me was understanding more about these collaborative processes. So once again, the point is not that we should choose one of these, but that you have to recognize where the strengths and weaknesses lie in each of these approaches and choose accordingly and come up with a good blend. So what does this mean? for ocean management, for marine spatial planning in particular. And I would say, and uh, in the book, I talk about the lessons for all the different players, for Congress, for the National Ocean Council and federal agencies, for the states and the regional planning bodies, which are, of course, are still very new, for the courts, for all the relevant stakeholders, and for the research community that um, obviously also has a big role to play. Some of the 
specifics, and I'm not going to go through all of these, um, although you can ask about them, uh, Congress ideally could play a role by making some broader national statement about what we hope to achieve in the ocean, what are our, do we have renewable energy goals, as has been done in, in the EU, do we have um, protection goals, do we want a certain amount of the area protected. They could say broad national things, but it's very unlikely in the current climate that we're going to see much of that from Congress. I think the NOC, the federal agencies, the states, the RPBs are starting to do some really interesting stuff in getting together and talking about how they could be more coordinated. I think that's very promising developments there. But I think they probably need to look for and encourage more sub-regional dialogue planning uh, involvement. The community level, uh, the people I've talked to along the mid-Atlantic coast, which is where I've been focusing lately, feel quite disconnected from that regional planning process. Although you know, there have been attempts to reach out, the, the local people have not really weighed in as much as they might. And issues of local significance can be overlooked when you're dealing at that large regional scale. I also think that the RPBs and the NOC could do a better job with their stakeholder engagement. Right now it's a fairly old-fashioned approach to stakeholder engagement. It's what the Forest Service did in the 1970s and 80s. Namely, you know, you, put, you, you write things and you put them out for public comment and you have meetings and you have people come to the mic for two minutes at a time to talk. That's a very old-fashioned approach to stakeholder involvement and the Forest Service has moved well beyond that into convening genuine dialogue at, at, uh, at smaller scales. Uh, one Forest Service manager who I spoke with said, I don't even consider myself to be managing this forest. I consider myself to be managing the collaborative process that leads to those decisions. Um, I, I, this, that level, federal agencies and RPBs, I think, also have a big role to play in, in data gathering, and they've done a pretty good job with biological data and less of a good job collecting the kind of social science data, the social and cultural information that they need, which probably, I'll jump over, gets to the research community. Uh, on the, the flip side of that is that I think the research community has not been as effective as they could be at explaining what they know to the agencies, state and federal, at the state and federal level. So there are a lot of the, these, these conferences I went to on environmental conflict resolution were absolutely fascinating, but there was virtually no one there from the ocean community. The, the field of collaborative governance came up primarily through land-based management. And I don't think the research community has a, done a very good job conveying what they know to decision makers. And then finally, jumping back up, I'll just say something about stakeholders. I think stakeholders, which includes advocacy groups from it, the environmental side and also uh, industry associations, could find better ways to serve their constituents' interests. Of course, they have a position that they're trying to represent, but I think they could do it while acknowledging the legitimate needs of other sectors and communicating more openly and respectfully. There's a tendency to demonize, and in my interviews I heard that a lot, to demonize the other side, that they're, they're crazy, they're extreme, they either don't care about the environment or they don't care about people, and I think the stake, all the stakeholders could do a better job reaching out and um, lowering their fists a little bit to reach a better solution. Um, I'll leave you with this one quote, and you can guess who, where it comes from, what setting. <clears throat> Planning has been controversial. Some have argued that the process is too technical and expensive, but it does create valuable inventories offers the potential of engaging the public, and holds out the promise of creating ordered and principled decision making. Ocean or forest? Actually, 1987, about forest service planning, but I think the same could be said right now about marine spatial planning.
So that's it. I'm eager to have your, hear your questions. There's some information about how you can reach me on Gmail or LinkedIn or ResearchGate, whatever you tend to use. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan. That was absolutely awesome. Um, we already have a, a several questions coming in, and I have several for you as well, but I promise I will hold mine for later. <laughs> um, so just a reminder, if you have questions for Morgan, um, you can just click a little reddish arrow in the top right-hand corner of your screen to bring out the GoToWebinar control panel. And um, just use the Q&A panel in there, and then we'll get your questions in. Oh, and also, I just pulled up my Excel spreadsheet, and number 108 uh, corresponds to Chris Fiddler, who, Chris, um, you look like you're still on here. Uh, so if you uh, just want to send us your mailing address in the GoToWebinar control panel, or I'll email you uh, after the webinar, um, since I have your email right here with the registration. Uh, congratulations, Chris. And thank you, Morgan, for offering a free copy of your book. Um, so with that, first question. Um, why uh, was the Bureau of Land Management land not a good analogy to the ocean? Uh, a couple of reasons. I mean, primarily, uh, one of the reasons I was that um, it's very degraded generally. It was so overused, most of the BLM, and, and the history, which I, I, is fascinating and is in the book, um, of how it got to be that way. BLM lands were sort of the leftover lands. Uh, the government owned a lot of land, much more than it does now, and was giving it away to various people, giving it away to the railroads and to homesteaders and various other people. And then it started creating these protected lands, so it created the national parks, created the national forests, and then at some time there were a bunch of kind of leftover lands that nobody really wanted <laughs> that still belonged to the government, and those, um, I'm simplifying of course, those became the BLM lands, so they generally were less desirable, more degraded. Um, and um, so I don't have quite the same value in terms of recreation and everything else. So that's why I thought they weren't as good a match to the oceans. Excellent. Um, so stakeholder engagement is becoming increasingly uh, a more of a part in agency decision making, um, aka the technico technocratic decision making that you mentioned. Um, but now that agencies are reaching out and doing stakeholder engagement, would you see that kind of becoming a fifth type of decision making between collaborative and technocratic? So I say that last part again. No, uh, would you see there being a fifth type of decision making emerging between the collaborative and technocratic decision making because of the uh, engagement? Stakeholder. That, mm -hmm. Well, I guess I would consider stakeholder good stakeholder engagement is fits under that collaborative uh, rubric. The kind of by the book stakeholder engagement that I see too often is just part of the sort of formal technocratic process in my view. Um, yeah, the law requires that you do public comment and the law requires these open meetings, but it's not truly hearing from the stakeholders. When you're really trying to get them to talk not only to the agency but to each other, that's where you get into collaborative decision making. So I would put genuine stakeholder engagement under collaborative and the pro forma stakeholder engagement under technocratic, but, but I mean, there are no clear lines, of course, that's why I have it as a circle for that part. It's a merging of different spaces. Excellent. Uh, so have you found any close proxies in the terrestrial public lands management to the Fishery Management Council process? Um, well, it's very interesting, and I, I think there are lots of analogies you can make that, and, and differences as well. In the old days, the timber companies were much more directly involved in managing lumber timber resources, which may be closer to where we are now with the fishermen being very involved in managing fisheries. They moved away from that process so that now it is more agency run, the decisions about where, where trees will be cut and where they won't be cut. So the, it is, the, the regional fishery management system is somewhat unique, and there, there is not a direct analogy to that, although I think if you dig deeper to see what the kind of decisions they're making and how they get made, you will see some analogies. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Uh, what would a sub-regional sub -regional, regional planning body look like, and would you consider that to be more intriguing to the public? Yes. 
uh, I definitely have more interest from based on the people I've spoken to. If you talk to sort of, I won't say ordinary people, these aren't, you know, men on the street, but people who have an interest in, in coastal areas, you know, sort of local mayors, local planning councils, they really know nothing about this RPB process. It's not on their radar screen. In fact, one guy I was speaking to yesterday said, kind of guilty, to said, I, I kind of heard of it, and I guess I should know something about it, but it really, I don't understand how it impacts my life. So those people, kind of people who day to day spend a lot of time thinking about coastal and ocean issues and working with them, have not been effectively involved in the RPP process, and I think the only way to do it is, as I said, to create sub-regions. What exactly that would look like um, will vary from place to place. Again, I think flexibility is important, but I could imagine having local sort of advisory councils uh, engaging those kinds of local leaders to talk about what's, what's important to them, what's important to their communities, to their region, and then using that to, uh, in a kind of nested way, to build up to a larger regional plan. Perfect. Um, so let's see, we have another question here on um, sustainability and the planning processes. Uh, did you see mention sustainability in uh, the terrestrial planning process, and did those differ from between marine and forest systems? Oh, sustainability is huge in the vocabulary. I mean, every, every word, every term that you hear in the ocean world has been fully explored in the forest world. So the move from, you know, a, a optimum yield kind of perspective to ecosystem-based management, a focus on sustainability, all, all those concepts have been very thoroughly explored in the forest context. And yes, the, the aim is to have long-term sustainability and has been for probably 100 years, but our understanding of what that means and how to achieve it has changed considerably. Okay, we have another really interesting question here on the controversialness of uh, forest management. Uh, do you consider forest management to still be controversial, or did you see a point where management of forests didn't become controversial anymore? It varies hugely from forest to forest. Even just the three case studies that I looked at, each one was quite different. Um, there are some forests where it's still true that every timber sale is challenged in court. But one of the forests I looked at, and one of the ones that has focused most on collaborative management, they have, they have, in fact, been able to cut more wood. The timber industry is actually happier there because they have worked on this collaborative process and agreed on some areas or some kinds of trees that can be cut. And they, uh, it's a long story, but they, the cut is targeted for stream restoration, specific trees that even the environmental community thinks kind of should be cut, or where there was monoculture before and they want to ex try to move towards a more mixed ecosystem and they want some of the monoculture cut down selectively. So the timber industry is actually able to get in and cut some trees because it's seen as an advantage to the ecosystem as well. Um, so mixed results. In some places, um, the collaboration has led to success from both, and for, from everyone's point of view, and in some places it's still extremely controversial. Interesting. Uh, so we have several questions here that are all about the uh, innovation and stakeholder engagement process. Uh, so I'm going to try to lump all those together here in one. Um, are, can you give some good examples of terrestrial stakeholder engagement uh, and how that has been received by stakeholders and just basically like how you would reform uh, marine spatial planning stakeholder engagement besides just the sub-regional planning bodies? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's difficult, and I'll say right away that I'm, you know, I don't have a simple answer. I wish I wish I did, but I have some broad ideas and guidelines about what seems to work better and what seems to work worse. Um, the, the, what the first part of the question was examples uh, where it has worked better. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Um, 
and in general how it works. So there have been lots of places in the forests where they've put together these collaborative uh, efforts. So they bring everybody together, everybody with an interest in the forest, whether it's uh, industry, environmental, community people worried about jobs, um, recreational interests, including motorized recreation. Everybody gets together and tries to come up with common ground. And as I said, sometimes that has worked very well. The problem with it, and it gets right back to those trade-offs, national groups have generally been very unhappy with these collaborative processes because they feel cut out. So the local, you, you can't really, it's pretty hard to involve big national groups and associations in what you're, when you're trying to build sort of a, a feeling of community and trust. They just have a different perspective. So it's generally been more local people who are part of these collaboratives. And the national interests say legitimately, say the big environmental groups, um, our members in Washington DC should have as much have as much say in what happens in this forest in Oregon as the people who live in Oregon or the people who live and work in that forest. So they've been quite unhappy with it. Same, same thing with the big timber associations. So you're making a trade-off often there between national and local, small scale, large scale. Mm -hmm. um, and those, some of those collaborative decisions have been challenged on those grounds. Did that answer the question? Did I miss Yeah, I, I think that did it very well. Um, so there's just kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, seeing that many of the regional planning processes are quite capacity limited, uh, do you think it, it's possible to do uh, a good balance between the national engagement and these like small, smaller regional scale processes uh, when you don't have that many staff to actually like go out and engage with so many different local stakeholder groups? That's an excellent, excellent question. And it, it speaks to the weakness of the RPB system, namely, that it does not flow from a, it goes back to this, all the different people who need to be involved in decisions, it does not flow from a national decision by our elected Congress that this is the direction we want to do, go. So it's not associated with appropriations or any kind of, you know, legitimacy on the budget profile. It's being done sort of on the side for most of the people involved in it. And yeah, that that will limit its effectiveness, no doubt about it. That's going to limit its effectiveness. It limits what it, they can do. Um, and I understand that. But without doing that real outreach and engaging communities and going down to the smaller scale, I think the resulting plan will just inevitably be uh, hard, to, hard to stick with, hard to enforce, hard for people to buy into. <sighs> Only we had government support between our... National planning <laughs> values. <laughs> yeah, if only. You could, you could still hope it'll happen. <laughs> uh, so uh, another question here. Um, so forest lands, although extensive, are split into individual units. And each of those units are generally allowed to manage their own lands under federal management directions. Uh, how would this look in a marine landscape where connectivity is higher and there's less, like, real, quote, unquote, zonation? Yeah, that's, that's a decent point. And... I think there are a couple of answers. I think forests are less well-defined than ocean people think. Um, there are arbitrary bound boundaries all over the place. In the Pacific Northwest, they decided it didn't make sense to go forest by forest, and they have a whole region-wide plan for the Northwest, in addition to then sub-plans. So I think they struggle with similar issues. The, the, you know, the spotted owl or whatever species you're interested in is not confined to a particular forest. And the same thing would happen in the ocean. You would have some relatively arbitrary boundaries defined, just because that's what human beings do when they want to make sense of things and manage things, that you know correspond to some a certain kinds of population or certain kinds of current limits or geographic limits of some kind, recognizing that they do have porous boundaries, just like forests have porous boundaries, and 
nesting, as I said, from smaller to larger scales so that you catch the boundary effects. Uh, the forests, because there is so much private land around them, I think, if anything, that's what, if, if right if we'd left things as they were, the forest is just as continuous as the ocean is. What makes them defined areas is largely that they're surrounded by private lands that are usually treated very differently. But I, so there are differences for sure, but I think still uh, lessons to be learned. And then we have a quick question here um, about committee decision making. Uh, did you investigate any committee decision making processes in the, the forest lands management? We are obsessed I'm with committees in the ocean. Yeah, I'm not sure what is meant by committees. Committees of? Uh, I'm thinking along this lines of, uh, oh gosh, like you have a, a committee that does like data and science acquisition for a regional planning body, and then like the data that they come up with is the data that gets used. Um, well, there, there have been a million efforts at various committees in forest management, the science committees on science. I mean, whenever there's a big um, controversy, whether it was about a particular disease in a particular forest or a particular species that they're trying to protect, they're always setting up committees of experts to give recommendations. But uh, in the end, those are always recommendations that go back into the official process. So, uh, if, if there's some other kind of committee, I'm not thinking of it, but that it's there have been a million forest committees, but it's always advisory. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then I think the last question here before we wrap up, uh, where is the best place to buy your book? <laughs> well, um, probably the answer is Amazon, because it's slightly cheaper on Amazon. You can go to the Rutledge book the Rutledge webpage, you can buy it there. It's slightly cheaper on Amazon, but it is not cheap, I'm afraid. These kinds of low number textbook type books are not cheap, but it is available on Amazon. And you can always beg your local libraries to get it too, uh, especially if you're at a university. Librarians yes. are always good at that. Especially universities. I, I, I would hope that all universities with ocean programs would have this in, the, in their library. Excellent. Well, uh, Morgan, thank you so much for presenting for us today. And uh, I think with that, we should wrap up and let you go. You've been presenting for an hour now, and I can't imagine how exhausted you must be. <laughs> uh, so we Thanks will have for having me. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we will have this uh, archived in about an hour on Open Channels. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Bye, everyone. <laughs>